birth depends as much upon sex energy as to physical birth and the propagation of species. In the tutorial on deviation, we followed Siddhartha's early development until his bold departure from his father's kingdom, having rejected Mara's temptation to stay in comfortable luxury. In search of liberation, Siddhartha now chooses the opposite extreme to his former life. He will travel the path of asceticism. However, after six years of ascetic life, and although his body becomes as thin as a skeleton, he still does not attain enlightenment. On the verge of starvation, he witnesses a music teacher instructing his student how to tune a lute. Too loose and the string won't sound, says the teacher. Too tight and it will snap. You must find the middle way. Siddhartha realizes that he has erred in swinging to the extreme of asceticism. He too must find a middle way. Inspired by this new revelation, he sits under a Bodhi tree facing east and resolves never to move till he attains liberation. Mara said, while yet he stands within my reach, and while his spiritual eyesight is not yet attained, I will assail him to break his vow. He announced the news to his army and drew out to battle. In that army, no two persons carried the same weapon. They were all different in their appearance. The tutorial on deviation taught us to expect our habits to strengthen as a result of our efforts to control them. It also taught us to expect them to approach with subtlety. Mara and his army embody these two principles. Siddhartha's resolution elicits their resistance unlike ever before. They crowd upon him in various shapes and forms to deviate him from his purpose. Siddhartha responds with the only reasonable response to imaginary assault. He disregards it. The more he keeps aim, the more fiercely Mara opposes his aim. Siddhartha has now fashioned his cosmos in the image of the Hindu churning myth, the parts affirming his aim pulling on one end and those denying it pulling on the other. Despite Mara's assault, the determined Siddhartha remains untroubled like a lion seated in the midst of oxen. This picture of serenity amidst chaos has become a hallmark in Buddhist imagery, illustrating the effort and price that precede liberation. The less the saint feared the frightful hosts of that multitude, the more did Mara continue his attacks in grief and anger. One rained down from the sky a great shower of live embers, but that shower scattered at the foot of the Bodhi tree and became a shower of red lotus petals. Others poured a shower of stones upon that tree, but it turned to a pleasant shower of flowers. The legends of the assault of Mara and the churning of the milky ocean draw from natural principles. Friction generates energy. But the process of generating energy through friction doesn't last indefinitely. Churning reaches a point of combustion, which fundamentally alters the nature of the entire process. Once churned matter combusts, the resulting flame bears its own momentum. The eyes that formerly threatened our effort now augment its flame, as water and wind only strengthen an established fire. 
Thus, at a certain point in Siddhartha's meditation, Mara's interruptions are no longer experienced as assaults, but as fuel. Embers hurled at him turn into lotus petals. Stones turn into flowers. What was previously a negative influence now turns positive. This marks the point of transformation. The many eyes remain, but their sense of I is lost. Our persistent efforts have transformed our identity from the many eyes to real I. We are what observes, not what we observe. If it uses its own energy, the sex center stands on a level with the higher emotional center, and all the other centers are subordinate to it. Sex energy now fuels consciousness rather than habit, which means that our efforts are driven by a new surge. Our chaotic functions fall into subordination. Our internal churning has re-established order in our microcosmos. We have achieved inner liberation. True identity is neither in Buddha's discipline nor in Mara's army, neither in the gods nor the demons, neither in affirmation nor in negation. True identity resides in the part that witnesses the struggle. We are what observes, not what we observe, the middle way alluded to by the music instructor, which brings us to this week's exercise to verify the principle of transformation. Aim to tug against a difficult group of eyes to the point of transformation. If it is a particular form of negativity, then aim to avoid its expression. If it is a particular physical habit, then aim to avoid its manifestation. Within a limited period of time, Focus all your resources on this struggle, just as Siddhartha focuses his. Aim to witness a shift in identity. Once you verify that the struggle with the many eyes doesn't last indefinitely, that your persistence brings you to a point of combustion, then you have verified the principle of transformation. Transformation